Well, it's lovely to be back in Venice, seeing you again, Gregory. You are one of the busiest people I've ever met. You're a professor of American literature at Cafoscari. Um, you've written your own books, as Alvise Marangon, the stories, and uh, you, you've found the time to translate a really interesting book that hasn't been available ever in English. It's a fascinating story, and I'd like to talk about the story. It's also a fascinating story about how the book proceeded because it was published in Italy in, what, 1986? 1986, yeah. And the authors haven't been with us for quite some time, but did you meet both of them? I met both of them, yes, back in the 1990. I translated three of their novels, actually, while they were still both alive, and they were very keen on going through the translations. So I went to Turin and Franco Lucentini's house. We sat there for the whole day as... Franco Lucentini read one page, passed it to Carlo Frutero, and occasionally they would make a comment. I'd never spoke to them in English, so I never heard their spoken English, but they both knew English clearly very well. Yeah. And the comments they made were always to the point. Occasionally they picked up a nuance which I might have missed. You know, I was fairly fresh to translating at the time. Well, imagine. Um, and occasionally they questioned some word choice of my own, and I was able to, you know, to justify it, and they, and they accepted it. It was a very fascinating experience. I did three of their novels. The first one I translated was a book called The D Case, which was a, a continuation of Edwin Drood. And that was published, and that came out in America, and then in the UK with Chatham and Windows. Uh, and then I did the novel that had just come out, the um, Enigma in Luogo di Mare, which was a, a what was it called in English? A riddle by the sea, I think. Hmm. Uh, and that came out with Chatham Winters. And then I translated this one, the, um, the Lover of No Fixed Abode. But unfortunately, I don't know what the reasons were, but with the first two novels published with Chatham Winters just didn't make any headway. And, and they decided not to go ahead. Although they paid me for the translation, they decided just to leave it. And, uh, and so there it was and nothing. nothing and do you came. think it's the best book of the lot? I think it was definitely the best book of the lot, yeah. I mean, if, if they'd started with that one, I think things would have gone very differently. Um, and what were they like? Because they, they, were they journalists or...? Were they... No, they were, um, they were both they were journalists. They were very, very literary people. I mean, they, they spent their life in, in, in the world of journalism, but mainly books and literature. They were, they were anthologists. They published humorous articles. And then they published this series of novels. The first two novels, which were translated into English, I think in the 1970s, were very big hits, both in Italy and abroad. I'm not so much in the UK, in, in English, I don't think. But the first one, they actually made a film of it with Marcello Mastroianni, and it's a very good film. And the second one was then made into a television series, again with Marcello Mastroianni playing this, the lead, and that's also a very good series. I have seen the English translation, and I think it's... It needs a, do a makeover if they decide to republish those two. I think they would need to rework that translation. Mm. The, the thing that I found very interesting is that today writers are pinning down. You are a crime writer. You're a yeah, genre writer. You, you keep writing the same mm. kind of book all the time. Mm. These guys were all over the place, weren't they? I think they did science fiction. Oh, they, they, were, they didn't write science fiction, but they, they ran the most important publishing a series of science fiction novels by Mondadori in, in, hmm. in Italy. You might say they introduced science fiction to the Italian, because there wasn't much Italian science really? fiction. Really? It's mainly an imported genre, but with a big following in Italy. Hmm. Uh, and this series they created called Urania was very popular, very, very, very simple, cheap editions published by Mondadori. But they obviously didn't feel constrained by by anything. I got the impression that they could go pretty much anywhere they felt like. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yes. And they, they also translated, I think, both from French and uh, English. Mm. Um, and as I say, they were publishing regularly short articles, often of a humorous type, uh, satirical articles. I think for the La Stampa, or maybe Corriere della Sera, I'm not sure. Did you ever see them again after that? Um... No, I never saw them again. We had some correspondence. And then when, when the, they didn't publish, the Venetian novel. I was very disappointed, obviously. I didn't think of it for a long time until I, I it just struck me, it was a good novel. And so I wrote a blog article about the, the missing Venetian novel in the sense that many people were missing out readers who were interested in Venice. Mm. There is this novel which um, has been a bestseller in, in many languages. And for some reason, it was, just wasn't available to uh, English readers. 
And so I've written this short blog piece on with a sample of the um, of their prose. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it was that. But it's not, it wasn't long after that that I was contacted by Bitter Lemon Press. Um, I, and they said they were interested in publishing Frutero. And they asked me, there was the whole question of the rights. And did Which I, can be complicated. It, very, it was very complicated. I didn't know who had the rights. They, I eventually got in touch with Chatter and Windows, etc., and sorted it out. And they paid me a, a reasonable amount to tidy up because I felt that I translated it 20 years ago. I was, I think my prose style has developed. I, my mm. knowledge of Italian is certainly a good deal better now. So you had to type it all into to the computer and start afresh, basically. No, I had a, an Amstrad, a version I'd done on an old Amstrad, which I was able to convert and work on that. Well, I'm glad you wrote the blog post because I'm sure if you hadn't done that, I mean, really, you've been a flag bearer for this book for years and it's great. Yeah. To, yeah. to see it out and it looks good it's a great cover it's got a lovely cover they've done a very good job with that and it, it if we talk about the book it, it's kind of difficult to categorize it's not crime it's i suppose it's a mystery it's a mystery um uh but it's not like anything else i've ever read really it is a very unusual style of book and it paints this picture of the Venice of what I guess must be what the 1970s, 1980s. I guess it's the 1980s. Um, yeah. That is extraordinarily vivid in a way that as somebody who's been coming here for you know 25 years, I, I recognise that the place has changed, mm -hmm. and I can see the the difference between the the Venice of the book and the Venice now. I, I don't think it's necessarily a period piece somehow. No, I don't. That's not the way I think of it. Mm. No, it's, um, yeah, I think because. So many things of Venice don't change. You can read it and, and still see the Venice we know and we love. Obviously, you know, there wasn't the, there was certainly tourism. There wasn't the mass tourism that there is now. But tourism had, plays a big role in the novel, obviously, mm. because the, the main character is a tourist guide. Uh, or is he? You know, this is the, mm. this is part of the mystery. Mm. I suppose without getting any spoilers, how would you describe the story? Um, well, it's a love story. Uh, it's written partly in the first person of this Roman, let's say, she's, a, she's an art dealer and she's obviously from the, the Roman aristocracy. Uh, and she meets this rather down-at-heels tourist guide and unexpectedly finds herself falling in love with him. Hmm. Uh, but then becoming intrigued as to you know, who is he, why is he doing this job? He just doesn't see, there are aspects of his character that just don't seem to fit with the um, yes. the, the is job. he a spy? Is, is he, he a, a spy? Exactly. Is he, there is something. Is he on the run, uh, mm. etc. And so she's. Is, if the mystery is basically that, who is Mister Silvera? There's also a side plot which is to do with chicanery in in the art world. Mm. Uh, that part of the the story is is very intriguing as well mm. and convincing. You feel that they uh, they they know what they're talking about, the writers, and you get a picture of Venice in. Sort of not all seasons because it's set just over a few days, but all weathers certainly. And you get in Venice, the high society. You get a wonderful dinner party in a in a palazzo. You get the Venice of the back streets, the, the cheap hotels. Do you think they came here to write it, or did they obviously knew Venice? They very knew well. Venice very well. Yes, mm. yes, yes. I I mean, they, I imagine they they came very regularly because mm. it's not a novel you could write just after. A, you know, a few days. No, very definitely yeah. not. I mean, it just has that feeling of yeah. authenticity to it. Mm -hmm. And it also has that sort of 1970s, 1980s, it's before AIDS and all the rest of it. It's, it's quite sexually liberated as well. I'm not sure we would write books quite like that. It's not a book that could be written today, I don't think. The publishers were worried about one or two um, expressions here and there, which they felt might not be. Uh, acceptable to modern readers. I don't feel there was anything actually offensive in it, but uh, and in in most cases it was just this was the character. This was the way that that person would speak. One of them is a is a the doorkeeper, the concierge of a hotel, and his thoughts are not necessarily politically correct. But no, um, but um, but yeah, people are like that. Yes. Are like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes. And are there more? Books by them to be done? Well, there's one that's already, I've now got the first proofs, and that should be coming out next year. That's a bit of lemon as well. That's bitter lemon, yes. And that one is set in Siena uh, during the Palio. So the annual medieval dirty tricks with horse race. racing. Dirty tricks with horse races, and a certain amount of, there's a supernatural element as well in this novel. And what will that be called? 
Uh, for the moment, the... Um... Because the Italian title is Il Palio delle Contrade Morte, uh, which means you know, the, the Palio of the Dead Contradas, because Siena is divided into all these Contradas, and they take in turns to run in this race. Uh, but there are also, uh, I think it's seven Contrade Morte, Contradas that no longer exist, but sort of um, have a virtual presence. But that is the explanation of the Italian title. True. Bitter Lemon thinks that would be too complicated for what most many people wouldn't know what a palio is just to start with. True. So, so for the moment, we have this provisional title, which is Runaway Horses. But are, are there more of their books to come? Well, then there's the, in, the one which is set on, which is a tr kind of traditional detective story set on the coast of um, Tuscany, which was published in the 1990s by Chaton Windus, um, and I think could now be republished. And I think Bitter Lemon is looking into the question of acquiring the rights for that one. Mm. I think the first two novels ought to be reissued, though I would advise a new, a fresh I translation. I need you to translate. Well, I, I'd be very happy to do it, I must mm. say. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I know very little about translation. Authors tend to be translated by the same translator uh, because yes, that's the, yes, exactly. means the style is consistent exactly, exactly, yeah. and the voice is consistent. Yeah. I know I always ask you this question, but when are you going to start writing your own books again? Yeah. Uh, very good question. And I am just coming up to retirement as I will be leaving the university at the end of this academic year. So that means in September. I I'm teaching my last courses now. And so when these courses end in June, I will then feel you liberated. Yeah, I'll be a free man. Yeah. And so on. I have a suspicion that your free time will soon get eaten up, though. There are many other things that I'll be doing, but, but you know. I mean, one of, the, you know, one of the things I have said that you do is you're an incredibly generous offerer of advice and correction for those of us who swung through Venice trying to write books <laughs> and make them sound authentic. I couldn't have done, certainly with the Arnold Clover books, mm -hmm. um, your insight was, was really, I really will, useful I'm and glad much appreciated yeah. on Thank that. You. Thank you. Um, so. You need to back off on that and just start writing your own, really, don't you? <laughs> but that doesn't take much to... How long have you lived in Venice now? I've lived in Venice now since 1981. So oh. that's 40, it'll be 43 years this September. So you're not planning to go back to England then? No, this is, this is my home. I visit England um, regularly. Well, not so regu regularly as I used to, but when we had small children, we always spent every summer, basically all summer in England. And do you feel you're half a Venetian yet? Uh, um, I have children who speak Venetian dialect, so I think that gives me a, a kind of, um, you know, I think you always are where you grew up. Mm. If, you, if you grew up in England, that's basically who you are, and you're not going to change that. But I feel very settled in Venice, and I feel I understand Venice now. And, but nobody ever takes me for a Venetian from the moment I open my mouth, like have an English accent. Mm -hmm. There's not much I can do about that. You know, my children both pass both for English or for Italians. Um, mm. You do know this city very, very well. You just told me the story about the, the wellhead outside. That's mm -hmm. the only one that's got, still got a winged lion on it because lion. Napoleon's yeah. soldiers yeah. never found it. Yeah. You must have spent an awful lot of time just walking around, looking at things and finding out what they all were. I think, yeah, I probably spent my first two or three years, I spent just doing that really. Uh, but, you know, I've never really stopped, but I remember, you know, certainly for those early years in Venice, I was always go walking around with my Lorenzetti or my touring club guidebook. Mm. So, yes, I feel like I do know the city uh, mm. pretty well. well. I'm very grateful for all the help you've given me, and um, I'm sure everybody's going to be very grateful that you managed to get this great book back into circulation in English mm. again. I'm sure it would not have happened without your efforts. And uh, it's a really good read. And uh, I, I enjoyed it enormously. Uh, so are, are there other lost authors you want to bring back into circulation with a translation? I would love to translate the plays of Goldoni, because when I wrote my Alvise and Marangon novels, which are set in Venice in the 18th century, one of the best ways I found of getting a sense of what the city was like was by reading the authors of the time, particularly Casanova and Goldoni. There's no shortage of translations of Casanova, but Goldoni is um, there are not many plays of his easily available in English. There's, there's a Penguin edition of, um, I think, three or four plays. Um, and, you know, or despite the fact that there have been plays which have proved enormously successful in the, certain the, adaptation. The Two Masters one is... Exactly, that's, exactly. I don't one think anybody realises that was gone. One Man, only, but, Two Dilmas, yes, you know, yes. extraordinarily successful. Mm. Um, 
but somehow this didn't sort of bring Goldoni into the uh, into the po popular awareness. Mm. Um, but you know, his plays are the best of his plays are um, extremely funny, very witty, very perceptive, wonderful pictures of uh, Venetian society. But not only Venetian, because they're not all set in Venice, but they certainly give you a wonderful feeling for the period, and they're very good. But both on the stage, but they can also be very good reads. I'm not offering to translate all of Gondoni because he wrote something like 120 plays. Um, but I certainly like to do uh, some of his, some of the best ones. And of course, the wonderful things about translating an author from the 18th century is you get all the royalties. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it, they obviously are of the period, but they're, they're quite modern in some of their um, approaches and. and, and the subjects that they're addressing are yet exactly exactly they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not just historical no, pieces no no no, no. They're, i mean they're, you know they're very lively plays I and mean, as was shown by the great success of one man two governors it mm. was just basically updated to um what was it 19, 19, um brighton in the 1930s i think i can't I, yes or 1950s perhaps yes. yes um but it was a, absolutely very faithful to the original story mm. it was just in different costumes Probably the Goldoni's best play would be La Locandiera, um, which is actually set in Tuscany. There's also a, another wonderful trilogy, the Trilogy della Villeggiatura, which is about the Venetians who go to the countryside, uh, to a villa outside Venice. I think you need to write another blog post. I do. You're right. You're right. Thank you. That's a that's good point. I'll do that.